<laughs> so, um, uh, the term folio um, refers to a size of book. So you can see that these are roughly, although not exactly the same size. Uh, and the size of book is important because um, this is the sort of size of book that you would expect to have a Bible in, or maybe a work of heraldry or a work of history or something. Um, and there's something really very odd and quite radical about putting uh, a collection of vernacular of English language plays into the folio format um, because it's a format which seems so high status and so serious. So plays have been published, playbooks have been published all through the end of the 16th century. They've become quite a significant part of the marketplace, but they're all published in little small single play editions, which we usually call quartos. And that's really that's a very low end part of the market. It's the market which is ballads and pamphlets and um, relatively cheap, um, relatively cheap print. And this is a really different high end part of the market. This is what you'll buy to put in your library. This is what um, sociologists would call cultural capital. You're showing off something about yourself by having this book, as well as as well as actually having it. Um, and that's interesting because um, this is the first time. Shakespeare's published in this format. It's the first time we get a collected edition of his plays. So Shakespeare's dead by this time, dies in, 15, uh, in 1616, 1564 to 1616. So he's been dead for eight years when the first, seven years when the first folio comes out in 1623. So it doesn't seem to have been his idea to put the plays together uh, for publication. Some people think that he was working on that when he retired. That's maybe a kind of romantic idea. Uh, it may be because we really want this book to reach back to the author in some more tangible way than it does. But actually, I mean, it's, it's a posthumous um, memorialising of a kind. Um, uh, it publishes um, 18 of Shakespeare's plays for the first time. So there are 36 plays in it in total. Uh, 18 of them have been published in these small quartos before 1623, and 18 of them have never been published before. It doesn't include any of Shakespeare's non-dramatic poetry. It's kind of interesting because the thing that Shakespeare was probably most famous for in his lifetime and shortly afterwards was one work, and, and that work was Venus and Adonis, which is a sort of saucy, slightly titillating, um, poetic, slightly camp kind of poetic thing about the goddess Venus um, who falls in love with this very unwilling young man Adonis. <laughs> so that was the thing that was most famous about Shakespeare, the, the bestseller, if you like, uh, of Shakespeare's writing. Uh, so, but we don't get that here. This is an entirely dramatic collection. Uh, and that's really for you guys because it's put together by actors. So um, there are two prefatory letters, one to uh, two noblemen, the Herbert brothers, and the other two, a more general group called The Great Variety of Readers. And those letters are both signed by two members of the King's Men, people who'd worked with Shakespeare, uh, and they're called John Henning and Henry Condell. And Henning and Condell, with Shakespeare, had been part of the original Chamberlain's Men, which was one of the um, first and best established, but sort of um, most serious and most professional of the theatre companies. Uh, they, they signed a bond in 1594, seven men who are all sharers or shareholders, which means that they're both actors and they're in a kind of cooperative, if you like. Um, I don't know if you guys are in a cooperative, but they, they're, they're, in a, they're in a cooperative. It'd be good to be in a cooperative when you've got good weather, I guess. But not, not so good in a rainy, in a rainy summer. Uh, so they, the, 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 the seven of them, Shakespeare and John Hemming and Henry Condell and other people including Richard Burbage, uh, and William Kemp, the comic actor. They all, they, they join uh, in this company, the Chamberlain's Men. Uh, and so Hemming and Condell had known Shakespeare for 20 years, uh, worked with him all that time. They're named in Shakespeare's will. He gives them money to buy rings to remember him by, mourning rings. Uh, so they're people who knew Shakespeare uh, and obviously have a particular relationship with his work. And they were obviously the people who were the sort of brokers between the theater and the printing house. So for those plays that had been printed before, uh, the, pr the publishers had to go to those previous printers and get the rights, just as you would now. But for the plays that hadn't been printed before, the manuscripts for those must have been all owned by the theatre, and they came from the theatre and were printed here for the first time. 
So one of the things that um, I've been thinking about quite a lot lately is um, whether this is a book which capitalises on Shakespeare's popularity or whether in some ways uh, it slightly tries to create that popularity even in the act of satisfying it. And we don't really understand the economics quite uh, of the first folio publication. So um, one of the things about uh, book printing in this period is that for some a uh, very odd reason uh, we don't want to go into. There is no printing quality paper made in England. All paper is imported from France. And so paper is a really big, sort of disproportionately big part of book publication. Uh, and of course, in order to print your book, you've got to buy all your paper in advance. Uh, that's the investment, really, uh, in, uh, in books. So it's a big investment, uh, this big book. Uh, it's a big investment of, of, of time and labour to set all these individual pieces of type. We were just working this out in our group before. We were trying to think of a methodology to work out how many pieces of type. You know, they're all individually set pieces of type. And we looked at the, it seemed to be about four million pieces of type which each got to be placed. You know, it's a huge input of, of uh, human resource, but also this big financial resource. So was it going to be a bestseller? You know, was this a, was this a, a kind of um, an obvious thing which was going to fly off the shelves? And it's interesting seeing these two books together, so nine years between them, 1623 the first, 1632 the second. Uh, for some historians of the book trade, they'll say, and it's sold out in nine years. It's <laughs> absolutely, you know, <laughs> sold like hot cakes. And for other people saying, God, it took nine years before they did a second edition. You know, this is a very, very slow burn, very slow uh, earner. And it's interesting to think about Shakespeare, who dies in 1616. Uh, the theatre in this period Kind of, maybe not so hard if you work in the theatre, but maybe hard if you sort of think about this uh, in, from the library perspective or from the scholarly perspective. You know, the theatre at this time is a really high fashion, young person's kind of entertainment industry. I think if you've got, you know, got sort of grown up and, you know, had a mortgage, and not that they didn't really have mortgages, but they did have mortgages, but what I mean is if you got sort of grown up and had children and did DIY and stuff, probably didn't go to the theatre anymore, you know, you've probably grown out of it. It was a thing that young people did. Uh, it changed very quickly. Uh, it was very dynamic. It was very easy for people to see, God, that's so last year, or that's so, you know, we tend to collapse all that distance now. But if you think about that for someone uh, who's maybe retired from the theatre in 1613, that's probably Shakespeare's last plays, um, maybe Two Noble Kingsmen, the play he writes with John Fletcher. So this is 10 years later. I, and my feeling is that for most artists who work in that kind of very popular, uh, constantly changing kind of industry, entertainment industry, that's probably a bit of a doldrum time for your reputation. You haven't got old enough to be classic or vintage or retro or, you know, all those things that happen generationally that we can see, you know, everybody goes back to, um, you know, we've recovered. This seems like, you know, it would have been to be the Beatles in the 70s or, I don't know, Jane Austen in the 1840s or something, you know, and suddenly discovers the Brontes and says, God, what was Jane Austen doing in that drawing room all the time? <laughs> um, you know, that, that immediately after something has been the thing, there's a real, you know, there's often a real slump. And I, my sense is that Shakespeare is probably in this slump. When we look at what the actors in The King's Men are performing at the time this book comes out, most of the Shakespeare plays have dropped out of their performing repertoire. They perform at court every year, that's their big showpiece of the year and that's where they bring out you know the plays that people want to see and they're not bringing out Shakespeare anymore by the 1620s they've got new writers uh, newly fashionable writers so this is a great um, it, 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 that's made quite a lot of scholars see the first folio as a sort of um, a kind of act of literary um, piety or or kind of uh, literary criticism almost uh, that it's saying something about the value of these plays which perhaps isn't isn't necessarily generally appreciated by publishing them at all and by publishing them in this relatively lavish format. So it's trying to uh, sort of set the tone for a new appreciation, a new posthumous appreciation of Shakespeare and what, what his value might be uh, into a, um, a cultural, at a cultural moment perhaps when Shakespeare's value is not, is not really particularly high. There are lots of really interesting things about the book itself. Uh, it tends actually to minimise the um, the fact that these are plays being performed by a particular company. Although there is a list that we might look at, uh, a list of uh, all the actors who've played in the in the 
in the plays. It doesn't tell you what parts they played, but there is a list of actors, and that list goes from those first seven sharers that I mentioned before, uh, all the way through to the most recent uh, recruit to the King's Mint. It's a kind of collective, rolling kind of um, uh, catalogue of who's, who's been in the who's been in the King's Men. So it's got that list of, of actors, but otherwise it tends. Uh, slightly to minimise the genesis of these plays in the theatre, and that may be part of trying to go up market and go literary, uh, is to say these these are these are things worthy of study and these are things to be read now. They're not they're not tied forever tied or uh, never tied to their theatre incarnation. And nor is the book uh, a secondary phenomenon after the after the performance. So we've struggled a lot when thinking about play printing. Do plays get printed? as a kind of afterthought, like the book of the film or something, which you would never ever buy unless you had seen the film and thought it was great. You know, it's a secondary, it's a kind of parasitic product. Um, or or were, they, were they becoming the thing itself, a cultural experience, a literary experience uh, in itself, uh, largely independent of stage performance? So the first folio might be quite an important stage towards thinking about these plays, not always uh, in relation to the stage, uh, but in relation to a new sort of leisure hobby of reading plays rather than just seeing them performed. But there is a load of stuff in these uh, printed texts about the theatre, loads of stuff about um, uh, what kinds of stage directions we get, whether we get very elaborate stage directions or very limited stage directions. Uh, stuff in a couple of places we've got the name of the actors instead of the name of the character. Mm. So the actors have sort of made their way uh, in, into the into the plays. They become so associated with the characters that the characters lose their sort of fictional names. Uh, and you know, but various various things about how these plays might have looked uh, on the stage and how they might have been uh, tweaked or re redrawn for different kinds of performance spaces. So a big change in Shakespeare's writing career, as you're probably conscious of because of all the stuff that's been about the new Sam Wanamaker Theatre at the Globe on Bankside, and indoor, was that Shakespeare's company were desperate to get an indoor theatre, um, partly to extend the playing season a bit, but also um, because the indoor theatres had a different clientele and much could command much higher prices. There were a more sort of boutique kind of theatre experience and people had to pay for that so they were quite a high, um, high return. They finally get the indoor theatre at Blackfriars in 1608 uh, and <coughs> my sense is that Shakespeare never really takes to Blackfriars himself. Uh, we don't know of any Shakespeare plays which are written solely for Blackfriars for indoor performance whereas for example we think that uh, a writer like John Webster probably is writing or Blackfriars as the only places uh, plays will be performed. Uh, but certainly Shakespeare's plays that are still in the repertoire get tidied up uh, and slightly represented for Blackfriars performance. And one of the big things that has to happen in that is they get divided much more clear, cleanly and clearly into acts. So in the outdoor theatres, um, pretty much as I think uh, we get, always go with the Oxford Shakespeare Company, they're pretty much continual, you know, a continuous performance one person's going out, out of your sightline and somebody else is coming in immediately. There's no, there's no divisions. We feel as if we're in a fluid space which is, which is constantly occupied. And that seems to be how outdoor theatres like the Globe worked. That's how performance worked there. In Blackfriars, because it was lit by candles, you had to have some pauses in the action because you had to deal with the candles. You have to, if you've ever had anything which is lit by candles, you know you've got to trim. The wicks get much too long and then the, and the uh, flames blow very... Uh, but very high, uh, or they all just burn right down, and you need to replace them. So Blackfriars plays have uh, a new interest in the old five-act structure, classical structure of drama, which was not really important at all, not really visible or legible in earlier plays. But for Blackfriars, the five-act structure becomes really helpful because it gives you a little break, three or four-minute break, probably with music to cover it while somebody comes on and sorts out the lighting. So you can see some plays have been either uh, prepared for Blackfriars performance or reworked. Uh, they were originally Globe plays and have been reworked for, uh, for Blackfriars. So this was meant to be more interactive than this, wasn't it? But I've just gone off on <laughs> my hobby course. But let me, so let, shall I just say a little bit about As You Like It in the, in the mm -hmm. folio? So As You Like It 
uh, obviously, a play from 1599, probably, you know, as James Shapiro has, has, has told us in a brilliant book called 1599, the sort of Annus Mirabilis for Shakespeare and for Shakespeare's company. It's the, it's the time they move into their first purpose built theatre, which they themselves own, the Globe, the, the theatre which we so associate with them now. So that's what happens in 1599, uh, and it's an amazingly creative time for Shakespeare, possibly because um, the investment in the Globe really means they've all got to up their game if they're ever, you know, if they're going to manage, they've got to really make this work. Uh, so he's writing uh, Henry V, uh, Julius Caesar, uh, probably finishing up much to do about nothing, as you like it, they're all 1599 plays. There's quite a lot of evidence that Hamlet has begun in this year, so he's got a huge number of kind of big plays in these very different genres uh, on the stocks. Uh, for some reason, As You Like It doesn't get printed until the folio, so uh, it's performed in 1599, it doesn't come out in, in, in quarto publication. And actually, the majority of Shakespeare's plays from the second half of his career, from As You Like It onwards, are not printed until the folio, whereas the majority of plays before that time were printed. Uh, we don't quite know how to interpret that difference. So. Um, so, as you like, it appears here for the first time. Uh, it's got some, there's some interesting features of it, I think, uh, quite interesting about how plays represent, for example, disguise. Uh, Rosalind, the character of Rosalind, obviously disguised as Ganymede uh, all the way through. Sometimes we get a stage direction which says Rosalind as Ganymede, but usually she keeps, she, she stays as Rosalind pretty much all the way through. All the speech prefixes are for Rosalind. So, if you're reading the play, the Rosalindness of Rosalind is much more pressing than the Ganymedeness of, of Ganymede. Uh, so that's a different kind of visual experience that you see the character underneath, or the character as they were at the beginning, rather than the transformation that you would see uh, in performance. And there are some interesting things we might look at that, about that at the very end of the play. Uh, quite a lot of editorial footwork about, and the question there is, uh, when Rosalind, uh, when Rosalind enters onto the stage, when Hyman is there right at the end, uh, is she back as her, in her women's clothes, uh, or is she still as Ganymede? There's no evidence in the first folio either way. Uh, editors have tended to want to think, if she's getting married, surely she must be a girl. Um, that, I think that's a slightly old-fashioned view now, but anyway, uh, if, she's, if she's getting married, she must be a girl. But actually, that doesn't happen in most of Shakespeare's other comedies, where women are dressed as men. There's actually quite a lot of play with the idea that they haven't changed back at the end. Uh, Twelfth Night being an obvious case, uh, and the end of Twelfth Night is a kind of uh, marriage or a kind of recognition of these couples, but Orsino, who has uh, paired up with, uh, Viol uh, with, with yeah, Viola, <laughs> stop for a minute, Viola dressed as Cesario, continues to call Viola Cesario, and they're all having a joke about how Viola's, who knows where Viola's women's clothes have gone and whether they'll ever come back. So there's obviously a kind of frisson there. Uh, in this idea, and there could be a similar frisson in, uh, in As You Like It that editors tend to uh, organise away by saying, uh, of course it's clear that when Rosalind comes in she's in her women's clothes, and there's a nice point which we'll look at um, just in that same moment of the text where uh, one of Hyman's lines is um, uh, saying, says, I, uh, we, we are going to join his hand with his, his hand with his, uh, and editors will always change the first his to her. Um, but again, you see that's a piece of work. You can say that's a mistake. It possibly is a mistake. It's a particular kind of mistake though. Uh, and it might fit with um, uh, a slightly more kind of fluid idea about sexuality or gender or something, uh, which is quite a playful sense of the end of the play. Maybe it fits a bit better with Rosalind's epilogue. You know, makes that a bit more continuous rather than having Rosalind um, sort of reincorporated into a sort of patriarchal institution of marriage and then pop up saying, ha you know, which of you fancies me, and men or women, or all of you, or uh, maybe it's a little bit more continuous and more playful through the end of the play.